And again, here we are with Josh Burnett Conquers the World. We've had a never-ending assortment of guests. You never know what's going to show up in the studio. And today, we have comic artists. Uh, we have my buddy Tom Neely over here. Hello. And his other buddy. Hi, Keenan Marsh Keller. <laughs> All of that. <laughs> Just call him Keenan, Keenan Keller. But uh, they're here to uh to grace your faces not only with uh with their artwork but to talk all the usual amounts of bullshit and trust me they are certified in being able to talk about bullshit uh, i have already pre-screened them for such uh over many of a a, a glass of alcohol uh questionable food content at late nights uh cd bars and uh smoky uh back room uh exchanges so uh uh you may know uh Tom's earlier effort, and that would be Henry and Glenn forever, and now they have Henry and Glenn forever and ever, also put together in this really fine graphic novel edition. Just came out, yep. We, uh, it was originally a miniseries of four comics, and we just compiled it as a book, and it's coming out right now, it, popping up in stores. It was supposed to come out in August, but some, mm -hmm. for some reason it's already popping up in some stores, so, um, but yeah, it's... Uh, it's huge. It's got a. It collects the original miniseries of four issues of comics, but then it has over a hundred extra pages of new stuff by a wide range of weird artists that I've scoured the country for, including Keenan, uh, as and just sixty other people that I think are some of the best weirdest artists on the planet right now. All right. So, well, and there's yeah. a reason why he's not a one man show today, and that's because together. They have combined their forces like uh, a miniature Voltron of sorts and created a new project called The Humans about ape biker gangs. Yes. It's 1970s, That's Bakersfield, California. Biker mm. gangs of ape men. Whips, chains, chrome, bananas. Are madness. we talking about uh, my usual Tuesday nights? Or are we talking <laughs> about. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Well, the bananas are <laughs> potassium. You don't want to cramp up with all the whips and the chains. You need the bananas if you're going to get in a chain fight, basically. Yeah. <laughs> it's good much. for recovery, too. Uh, the it next is. Day. It is. You could probably make a poultice out of a banana and then, like, pack it into the wound. They could make a weapon, too, you know. At least the slippery part, you know. They right. slip on the banana peel, and then you get them with the chain. Sure enough. Sure enough. Have you, uh, have you tried a banana peel in the ring? Uh, you know, I think they're <laughs> actually against most uh, athletic commissions really? laws. Yeah, that's, no, that's no banana shame. peels, N no fruit. No, that's no, a... no fruit. Well, I mean, you've never heard of anybody slipping on a orange peel, really, have <laughs> true, you? Or a, have you or really ever seen peel? anyone slip on a banana peel in real life, other than Three Stooges or cartoons? I haven't, but there's not a I lot can't. of banana I peels laying I, around. I really the street haven't anymore. either. No, it doesn't that really seem to happen. That might be like more of a bygone time. There are banana peels everywhere. In or the if 30s. you live in like Costa Rica or some <laughs> other jungle <laughs> habitat, maybe there's maybe there's a <laughs> there's a real surplus of banana peels everywhere, uh, or Tonga something you know. Oofa loofa, you know, slips Come. on the banana and they're like, ah, kumquats. Yeah, but. Uh, uh, I don't even know if a banana is really that slippery, a banana peel. Have you stepped on a banana peel before? No. I mean, yeah, just stepped on it. I mean, maybe on a tile floor, it might, but just on a street, I think it would just if it was a, if you If it was a kiddie pool full of KY and the banana peel was in there and then you stepped on it, I think you'd probably eat shit. But <laughs> I'm a grown man, and I think I that mean, if a banana peel was on the street and I stepped on it, I'd be able to – I don't think it would really move me. I'm 260. There might should be a no holds bar match where you get the the ladders, the chairs, the folding chairs, the barbed wire, and banana peels. Just open up a big <laughs> and tax. You also duffel get bag full of banana bag peels of banana everywhere. Peels, throw it across the entire ring. It's just a sli it's like mu mud wrestling at that point. You're just slipping and sliding all over the place. Yeah, but they have to have those sound effects for it. That they. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> boom. Somebody falls in there. But oh, he fell on his butt. Yep. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we, we, bananas. We, yeah, bananas. So in a banana-fueled uh, uh, psychotropic... The comic is actually not really about <laughs> bananas, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, you, 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 you guys managed to, uh, to pull your, pull your resources, writing and uh, 
and and the art obviously right keenan is the writer he actually came up with the original concept for the the book and then we've been developing it together for a couple of years i'm drawing he's writing and uh kind of doing a little bit of a you know stanley jack kirby thing of working mm-hmm. together collaborating yeah there's but, a give and a take but he's primarily writing and i'm primarily drawing and uh he can tell you a little you know if you want to talk about the story it's that. uh 1970s america and johnny the main character uh is returning home from vietnam and he's been long long thought long thought dead so and is everybody an anthropomorphic ape yes, yes. it's okay. an entire world it's an all of monkeys and monkey apes. planet but it also completely pretty uh, re- uh sorry resembles ours so like it still has vietnam so s- gotcha. similar history as ours but apes developed instead of humans yeah so and now he's come home from uh having been long thought dead and returns to his brother's gang, the humans and rejoins life as a gang member with his brother's gang. And they run drugs. They, uh, <laughs> get in bar fights. They, rival you know, gangs. yeah, rival gangs. They, they, uh, keep human beings. Play parts easy. <laughs> human beings are slaves in this world. So they're like kept as like animals uh-huh. experimented on. Do they like throw whatever. their poo? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Yes, they yeah. do, actually. Yeah. Yes, they do. All right, defense mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> and they also train them to fight like cocks, so they have skin fights where they fight the humans and like gamble Like cock on fighting, it. but it's skin fighting, human wrestling. Uh, but uh, so they're just like a bunch of just stiff boners just <laughs> swinging around, <laughs> and bashing into each other. Tim Vigil. You know, yeah. very, like, Fulci-esque with, like, uh, well, like Rome, the 2072, the new Gladiator. Yeah. They got, like, spikes <laughs> all over them, and they're just like, oh, I'm going to fucking grab you with my groin. It's a little bit, yeah, Thunderdome meets Cockfighter, more like Cockfighter in the uh, Warren Only movie. Warren Oates, yeah. Yeah, Warren Oates, sorry. War, why yeah. did I say Warren it, Only? It, Fuck, it, that's the NPR guy, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Warren Oates. Yeah, maybe, yeah. He's in a, maybe he is uh, an amateur Cockfighter in his spare time. <laughs> I mean, a, NPR guys, they could get down. <laughs> <laughs> They're always talking about, like, I don't know, people's rights and, you know, Jeez. the environment. Take yeah. them out. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a weird world where... But it's it resembles much of ours in a, in a lot of ways, you know. It's it, but it's it takes place in 1970 in Bakersfield, California. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm gonna guess that there's a lot of exploitation film from the 70s and 80s that. That's are, where all of our sources are coming from. That's and, you know, the heart of it. Big of sure. our inspiration is 70s exploitation yeah, film. Pure genre, you know, and the love for like feeding into and playing off of all those tropes. So, mm-hmm. give me, give me a top three from both of you. In terms of uh, not just for this comic per se, I mean you can go that way since I know you guys have been really you know head first into this thing, uh, obviously in developing it and, and getting it going, and you spent a lot of time. I've been following uh, Tom's art, well, I mean f- since long before this, but I mean in just ha- in recent uh, over like the last few months, just so much constant human stuff that he's yeah. sketching and putting out there and and doing reference uh drawings and, and everything for bikes and, and jackets and what have you to try and make it look as authentic as possible so mm-hmm. yeah, but you know give me give me three each one of you three three seventies exploitation films that would fall in line with well uh one thing that's not a film but easy writer magazine from oh, that time period sure. is like that is a big thing um, but Wild Angels, the Corman film, mm-hmm. uh, is probably Peter my Fonda, favorite. Uh, Nancy Sinatra. Uh, uh, it's my favorite biker film, probably hands down. But then oh, there's like the shittier, more seedier uh, Satan Sadists, which mm-hmm. I really enjoy. That movie, it's got great music, uh, and it's a fun ride. But then there's also like a little bit of the Vietnam aspects to it and stuff. I love movies like Combat Shock, which is like yeah. exploitation in a traumas. different way. Like yeah. that was one of the early Tra- films yeah. that they put out. On yeah. Traumas. Yeah, I mm-hmm. haven't. I haven't seen it. Uh, only because I just haven't gotten around to getting a, a copy of it, but I'm well well versed in what the movie's about. <laughs> yeah. an incredibly stark, um, grim, sadistic you know piece of film. It's like the worst depiction of New York ever, too. It's just so depressing and horrible. And it's a racer head meets a Vietnam flashback movie. So yeah. it's just really <laughs> dark. The whole movie's not not dark. Doesn't just describe the content or, or the the. The subject matter, like the movie, is actually really dark too. Yeah. Like the lighting's not that good. <laughs> it was quite cheap. Yeah. Yes, but yes. it's. A, I love that movie. So there's, there's a lot of movies that are influencing the humans and lots of other media, but those three: Wild Angels, Satan Sadist. Yeah. Satan Sadist. I saw when I think it was twelve or. I think 11. there's one on Netflix right now. Chrome, hot leather, and. Yeah, that's the one about the the Vietnam vet. Yep, and there's the uh, the hard ride is another is really low budget but it's like the story of like a vet coming back there's mm-hmm. a lot of that 
there's so no, no, no born on fourth, savages is no good. born on Fourth of July for you guys. Nah, <laughs> nah, not so much. I mean, I I like some of the more recent Vietnam movies I've been watching because we have some Vietnam in the third issue. We get into Vietnam flashbacks, mm-hmm. so I've been watching some like Full Metal Jacket and Apocalypse Now to just get some visual cues. But like for the most part, we're kind of going for our own thing. And Remember the doing, most like, uh, psychedelic extreme flashbacks. So. The most surprise Vietnam movie I ever watched was Dead Presidents. Oh, mm. out of nowhere, like, oh, this is a fucking Vietnam movie now. I didn't really uh, realize that. Yeah, in fact, I, there was none of that in the previews. And all that's I better than the rest that. of the story too. Like them coming home and stuff. I kind of don't like as much as I like the Vietnam. Yeah, stuff the Vietnam that. stuff was good. The coming home was. I thought it was good, but it also. It seemed like they were just willfully, I don't know, they didn't cover their, you know, like, how dumb could you be? I mean, that's why this is going to turn out so bad, because she's really <laughs> not thinking this through. Yeah. But then, you know, I guess they could, uh, you know, make the argument that that's why they're doing it in the first place. So, uh, who knows? But yeah, I just remember all of a sudden, oh, all right. Another surprising Vietnam film for me was, uh, um, you know, Rainbow Bright. That was really. <laughs> <laughs> what? I, I don't. I didn't see that. Uh, oh, maybe I saw had, the director's cut. She had Viet Cong cut. ears all around her neck and stuff. Yeah, yeah. she kept screaming scary. Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, as far as uh, reference-wise, in terms of the look and the feel of the comic? Um, I don't know if I can give you a top three, but a lot of like, I mean, I just, I, mm-hmm. I've, I've been a, a kind of obsessive collector of '70s B movies for. Mm-hmm. We've had many a conversation about 70s B film. And I'm all over the place. I mean, it started with my love of horror uh, horror comics and horror films. But then, like, you know, that bled into other genre movies and stuff. And, like, then, you know, in other 70s exploitation films. So then we were talking about it. It it just, like, gelled. But, uh, I don't know, some of my favorites, like, I mean, going even further back, I go, you know, I love all, like, Ed Wood and Herschel Gordon Lewis, Mm -hmm. like, early stuff. But in the 70s a lot of great biker movies like uh i actually really liked he doesn't like this one as much but angels on wheels is kind of a more ridiculous biker movie but i kind of like that one a lot because there's some great characters in it and the uh what's the the very first one with brando the one the of the wild early, bun- yeah, the wild uh, 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 uh the wild one the wild, the wild one, one. yeah because uh, Lee Marvin's character in that is yeah. so great, and he's like one of the people I've. That's where you about get lots lot. of the images, like the striped shirt, the yeah. horizontal line shirt, and like a lot of the ideas that people kept going back to in the biker genre mm-hmm. were brought up in that movie. And uh, but then like other movies, I mean like uh, John Carpenter's one of my favorites, Assault on Precinct Thirteen is one of my Same favorite here. movies That's ever. Mm-hmm. Um, just, Not a high biker quotient, but the gang quotient really. Yeah, gets the going. gang yeah. fighting is amazing, and don't don't and even pay attention to the remake. In the type of this, I've never even considered it. Like, yeah, I tried watching it on cable the other day, and it was pathetic. Um, Plus, it doesn't have the soundtrack to go with no, it. Really. Oh yeah, you got to have John Carpenter's soundtrack. <laughs> it's so simple and perfect. And uh, actually, that I mean, that's another thing we can talk about is like we're also doing a soundtrack for the comic book. Um, the the first issue we're releasing a seven inch with t- a split seven inch with two songs by two local bands called the Zigzags mm-hmm. and the Smelly Tongues, and then with each subsequent issue as the series progresses, we hope to release a couple of new songs like with Harasser. each one. Harasser, Harasser, we've talked to them. Um, we, we, should, uh, we need to get Harasser actually. Yeah, no, <laughs> definitely they're into it. Uh, <laughs> the first one is the Zigzags, who are local like punk thrash. So uh, is it stoner metal kind of band? Okay. And the Smelly Tongues, which is uh, Keenan's wife's band, they're they're more of like a weirdo punk, but they did sort of like a psychedelic crazy song on this one for us. So we're releasing a seven inch with the first issue, and then with each subsequent issue, we hope we can at least release a download version of a song with each issue, and maybe seven inch, future seven inches as well. But um, like John Carpenter, like we were talking to this band, uh, a friend of mine, Gray Holger, is a band called Hive Mind. That's mm-hmm. very minimal electronic, and he wants to do very like john carpenter-esque kind of thing for us um an italian pro a, like weird band called moran humanos that contacted us are interested um a band that we didn't even realize existed that actually exists in the universe of the humans called <laughs> boss kong just kind of like <laughs> contacted us out of nowhere and, like we're an ape band we're gonna write music for you whether you like it or not <laughs> and so they've already sent us two songs um so we're we're building a soundtrack with the comic and it's so a lot you, of fun. We're an ape band. That's, <laughs> yes. that's not the usual email that somebody They're gets, like, is hey, it? We're, we we're a band living in your monkey planet. We're going to write songs for you. And we're just like, all right, we can't Done. stop you. Do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, all called, right. they're called Boss Kong. Boss Kong. Yep. Yeah. 
So they got two songs so far. We'll see what happens with that. Yeah. And we, you know, we'll see what happens with other bands as, as the issues come out. We hope we'll some other weirdo bands will come out of the woodworks. Now, now I see you've got issue us. zero here. Mm -hmm. um, and this looks like you guys are uh, – well, it doesn't have any publishing logos or anything on it. So this is – we self-publish oh. this one. Yeah, we put that one out ourselves. And then the continued series will be put out by a larger publisher. Yeah, uh, which will oh. be announced at Comic-Con, which I think is this week uh, when this airs. So we are going to be – it'll be a regular series from Image Comics starting in November. Fantastic. How? So, what, uh, what What? kind of a initial run do you have planned? Including issue zero, it's a 10-issue story arc. Yeah, so nine nine issue mini series with image, and then we have ideas that we can elaborate on the world and continue it if it was a success. Mm -hmm. So, but the initial story of the humans is nine issues. Is this uh, well? It's not your first for foray into comics necessarily. Is this yours? No, uh, I've been self publishing and I've written and drawn comics for years, but this is my first time ever working with any company of note or having a real publisher of any kind so or working with an, uh, an or an, yeah and also collaborating i've never collaborated I've, I've written some things with my brother screenwriting wise but that's as far as it's gone i've never collaborated yeah and that, that's new cartooning. for me too i mean like i've done comics for hire which is kind of collaboration but this is the first time i've really, really worked with like a friend where we're like developing it together and yeah one of the first I've things i've written and drawn my own stuff i knew about before. you besides henry and glenn forever was you did a, a, a popeye mm -hmm. some popeye stories Mm -hmm. Doppelganger. As well. Oh, the Dell. I mean, the. Oh, yeah. Well, I did, uh, yeah, I did IDW. a few issues of the IDW Popeye series. Right. And uh, with the writer Roger Landridge, who's great. Um, and yeah, that, I mean, that was that was an interesting process. Didn't always, it didn't end well, but it, w it was good. And uh, I got my foot in the door of like, you know, getting a bigger audience out of outside of my well, normal underground sphere right. where I've been self publishing my own graphic novels and stuff for about 15 years and now. you got the opportunity to actually so. write something popeye well i mean you wrote obviously your yeah. own you did dump but i mean if this popeye guy fan. wasn't wasn't made to do a popeye story at some point i mean <laughs> jesus christ i mean the, the my my forearms aren't as big as yours but, no not quite but, but i got uh, the anchors yeah not not, not quite <laughs> well we're, we're keeping quite. the spinach out of the studio just in case we <laughs> yeah. don't want you to start punching stuff around looking for your olive oil we, we don't want the jeep to come shit. in yeah <laughs> just baking it up <laughs> chopping it up and doing a few lines He's going to, I'm the Jeep. I'm the Jeep. <laughs> yeah. But well, actually, I mean, that, that also, I'm also working on, I did a, what got me hired on Popeye was I did like a, my own bootleg surrealistic Popeye comic called Doppelganger. And then the, uh, one of the editors of, at IEW hired me based on that. Um, and I'm, I've got four other Doppelganger stories written, oh, bootleg sweet. Popeyes that I want to do eventually. We'll see. But I'm just, you know, whatever. Well, you've been churning out work for a while. I, I mean, yeah. Kiyo, our, our mutual friend Kiyoshi was the first person to, to talk about you to me and to introduce us. I, the, I think Kiyoshi did a, like a couple pinups or something for Henry and Glenn. Yeah, yeah, he's in there. He did the first, the opening story, the and, first two uh, pages. Um, you know, when I got to, to, to know about your work to begin with, first I was really surprised about this, but because what, what took me at first was the big prints that you were selling mm -hmm. at, uh, at Zine Fest. And, and uh, a lot of the wolf some metal artwork and yeah, stuff. And, Wolves and in the throne room and Isis and so I think yeah we kind of connected on a metal level first. right <laughs> yeah and and you know some of that that artwork itself it stands out it's very I mean it really it's it's got a lot of emotion to it they're very moving type pictures I mean they're not just they're they're very ag ag aggressive at times or but either way it's got something in it Mm -hmm. And so it's not normally what you would think of as comics. You would think of it more in a, of a fine arts so, sense. And as we got to know each other, you have a, a fine arts background as well, right? Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, it's kind of a weird back and forth. But, yeah, I grew up on comics. But I grew up in a small town in Texas where the only comics I had access to was Spider-Man and Superman. Mm -hmm. So, like, I never saw any alternative or underground comics until I got to art school uh in my late 20s or my mid 20s and that's when i finally discovered stuff like robert crumb and like and then current guys like daniel klaus and chris ware and whatnot and that just like and then from there i just like kept digging further and further into the underground for more weird and well wild stuff because i was like wait you can make comics about anything it doesn't just have to be <laughs> right. about superheroes like there's a whole other world in the underground of like weirdo comics about 
everything from just like boring personal stories <laughs> to like crazy over the top like exploitation stuff right and it's all over the place and that so i delved into that so that kind of pulled me away i was in art school studying painting and getting disillusioned with the art world and discovering underground comics at the same time so then when i got out of art school i was just like i just want to self-publish underground comics i don't care about the art world which i think is pretty cool and that so that's what i've been working on since then that so. you were you were going to school doing painting you know uh you know part of the fine arts side of things and yet you're like well that, that i mean art is art i mean and, and art can be in any way in any form i mean just because you could be a painter doesn't mean you couldn't be a comic artist doesn't mean you couldn't be a tattoo artist potentially yeah. mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and so i mean it, it, it any way you want to apply your trade as an artist i mean some things do uh, will will we'll carry over i mean just because you can do comics doesn't mean you can do fine art just because you can do fine art does not mean you can can put together a comic and it's not just about the line structure it's about uh paneling and it's their own their own art forms in itself but it's often that they don't people look at them as separate things like yeah if i yeah. do fine art you know i i have no interest in doing comics and if i do tattoos i don't even think about doing anything else yeah there's, there's a lot of delineation but it I, I mean to me it's kind of an equal playing field of like we're all artists trying to do we're trying to survive do whatever we can mm -hmm. to like put whatever we want yeah. image wise into the world so I'm interested in all that shit, so I would hope more people would be more interested in more things other than the thing that they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'd love comics, but I also love film, books, movies. You know, m music. You know, and that uh, that's something I try to do with Henry and Glenn forever and ever. The sequels, like, try to bring in as many underground weirdos and like people that you wouldn't expect into this book, because you know uh, the the original book was such a weird cult hit that I never expected. And it reached a large audience that I was like, well, I know all these artists that are great that nobody's paying attention to. If I can get them into this book, maybe the new, the Henry and Glenn audience will respond to them. I was flipping through this and thing. It's, it's all over the place. It's one of the weirdest books I've put together, but I think I'm proud of the way it came together. It's and, totally uh, schizophrenic. It's awesome. Yeah. It's and it, and it has beautiful. everything from like, you know, big name artists like the Clayton brothers to like a completely unknown guy, my friend Ruben Splatterbeast from San Jose, who's just like this. <laughs> obsessive oh, painter dude, you'd love you is, is he on the, uh, well. the east coast splatter beast he lives in uh, no <laughs> 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 you know he actually uh, this, uh there's a oh, what's their name i'm forgetting the name of the band but there's a band that actually wrote an album about him uh but uh, a metal band but um a whole album about one guy yeah he's just this a big dude this he's amazing he's, he's an amazing dude. artist who lives in san jose who just obsessively paints paintings about uh metal and horror movies and so he's in there well, I, I recognize you know, this guy, Benjamin Mara. Benjamin Mara. You had was, him. Uh, you you had me buy a couple of his zines that he had. Yeah, and he's but. amazing. He's a New York artist that I love. He's he's a weird underground guy who's he look his comics look like something out of like a twisted version of the '80s that you kind of remember through your mm -hmm. warped brain, but it didn't really exist then, but it exists now, and you're like. Well, it existed then too. You know what? Uh -huh. It somewhat reminds me of uh, some of the, the the promotional art that would be on arcade games at times. <laughs> yeah. Some of those beat 'em ups. You know, like, totally. what? The All this like chromed stuff, like yeah. the highlights, uh, and or everything. just just like what his what's wrong with his face? It's just <laughs> that guy doesn't look like the guy in the game. Mm -hmm. And that's something we want to continue with the humans too. Is like each issue is going to have a back cover pinup artist by one of our favorite artists. So the Issue zero is uh, Christina Cayantes, who's going to be the colorist for the, the Image series once it comes out. Oh, sweet. But the first issue from Image will have a back cover by Benjamin Mara. He's going to do our pinup. And pin then, so each issue will have a new pinup by another artist that we like that we can hope Johnny really Ryan's showcase. doing Johnny one for Ryan. us. Uh, Prison Planet. Yeah. Uh, and pulling from other, like uh, my friend Trenton Doyle Hancock, who's like a big shot in the fine arts world, but I grew up with him in Paris, Texas. We were high school friends so i asked him to do one he said he's gonna do it so that's like bringing another like weird element into the comics world that doesn't really fit yeah but our friend skinner is doing, doing one that. for us yeah skinner is great awesome yeah. metal artist the just did that mastodon on cover planet. that mm -hmm. everybody's talking about yeah so we're fantastic you, yeah. you've already you've it's like you've got uh everything you've got the whole thing planned to just continue to to just motor on and not only for yourselves, but to, to bring in a lot of other artists that mm -hmm. people wouldn't know about. And, and uh, you know, uh, I'm lucky enough that Tom did a shirt for me. Yeah, so, which is uh, awesome Which you can shirt. get at IndieMerch.com. Oh, yeah, I make you wear that today. Oh, IndieMerch.com <laughs> slash Josh L. Barnett, I believe. That's the, uh, you can find me, Josh, Josh Barnett, on IndieMerch. You can buy all my 
amazing t-shirts by people like Tom Neely, Kiyoshi Nakazawa. Yeah. Yeah, So, and part of that for me was, you know, when you have the opportunity to show what you think is cool, what it's not just a matter of, Oh, I think this person is popular or this person's art style is popular right now. It's, you know, being able to, to take what you enjoying and put it out in a, in a bigger audience. I mean, when you have the opportunity, you should. So I like the fact that, with this, you guys are, are bringing some of the underground right with you. Yeah, because we could maybe ask some like image artists and people that are already published yeah. and have like. I, mean, I do want Rob Liffield to do one. We do want <laughs> Rob. If, I, if I can get Rob Liffield to do or one. Or Eric Larson, but still. <laughs> For the most part, we want to like have our friends that might not ever have a chance to be on a comic that's printed that wide and that has that much distribution and. Yeah. Get, get seen. It well, be. art doesn't necessarily need to have to be that competitive. Art's no. subjective. So what one person likes, another person may not like. Oh, yeah. And we fully expect some of the art, pinup artists, people to be like, fuck that. What, why did you buy that? That's awful. Like, yeah, I mean, I get that with Henry and Glenn all the time. People tell me like, oh, this guy doesn't know how to draw. I'm like, fuck you. He's the most punk rock artist on the planet right now. <laughs> you just can't see it. And I'm like, like you listen to the misfits and you think that's great music but you look at this crudely drawn comic and you don't see the similarity like i mean misfits mm-hmm. is crudely produced music. yeah it's very crudely produced so, crudely played <laughs> like i mean you look at someone like i mean i'm, I'm gonna single him out but i think he's one of the best artists one of the in best the book trips. josh bayer is somebody that i often find people will be like i don't understand his art i don't know how to penetrate this story and i'm like if you can penetrate it it's one of the densest stories in the book mm-hmm. and it's really rich and really full and has a lot of history involved and a lot of insight but the art style is very crude and i think very punk is rock. this the guy that you were describing to me that does nothing but just draw constant like never stops drawing oh yeah every time he, i've yeah, seen him like he time. came out to stay with me for a week a couple of years ago and he spent like every afternoon at the diner up the street just drawing and he'd come home with like i just drew six pages of comics <laughs> and they're brilliant and but he's like that kind of like and that comes from my fine arts background, I think, because like being around people that like do that, it's like incessant. Mm-hmm. Like I don't care if it's perfectly refined; I just have to vomit this well, energy right. out of me onto the canvas, and that's what he does in comics form. But then, like you put it in front of somebody who's new, used to only reading Image or Marvel comics, and they're like, "I don't know what this is." Yeah, and it's like, a very but, specific stylized idea. But the same He's got a singular might voice. Still listen you know, to like, might listen to like something like Sex Pistols or Misfits mm-hmm. or whatever, and you're like. If you think about it in that context, that was very a crude form of music, and this is a crude punk rock form of comics. That's really the same form of expression. Well, and, and it's even though there's a writer so, who's developing a story, but the, the artists themselves are telling a story in their line work, telling a story in their paneling, telling a story in how they're laying out mm-hmm. yeah. all, all the the what what the action that goes on in in each panel. And so it's a matter of being able to identify with not just not just being able to understand what's going on by the art itself, but being able to identify with the story in the art that exists. Exactly. And, you, um, and how the, the style informs the story, too, I think, is important. Yes. I mean, it sets a bit of a tone. As yeah. much as you know, you're adding music to it, you're adding different things, and these are, um, these are things that will, will affect the way that you may view or understand what it is that you're... You, it yeah, will give absolutely. you a totally different experience. It's mm-hmm. sensory stuff like that to, to just try and get different parts of your brain working while you're while you're um just absorbing all of this information right it gives it a different feel to it it's really rad that way yeah yeah it's like i mean if you can think back to the first time you heard the misfits or metallic or something when you're like 10 or whatever and you use it you're like i don't know what the fuck this is like it's destroying my brain and then like a week later like i can't stop thinking about it i gotta go back and listen to that more like I hope that you know people have that response to right. I don't weirder know, styles of art. I would. I don't know if I would have gotten into Iron Maiden as much as I did as a kid if you know it didn't have if it wasn't uh, for, Eddie for Riggs. On the cover. Is, you know, artwork. <laughs> yes, totally. First reason I looked at it, you know, but same Likewise. with Megadeth. Any Megadeth cover, I was like, this must be good. Uh, Megadeth my, cover. That's uh, yep. uh, Ed Gottlieb, right, or whatever. Or oh, Ed 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 so Repka. Names now, Ed Repka. Yeah. Okay. I'm so bad at names. I can't remember who it was, but they're great. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, no, I mean, like, that was all, that's what got me into music originally. Like, that's what led me to Iron Maiden, to Megadeth, to Metallica, to Pink Floyd. Like, Mm -hmm. anybody that had, like, crazy, weird album covers that were artistic, that's what I was drawn to as a kid. And most of that was metal and punk because they had the most interesting covers. They did have the the most (laughs) interesting covers. We were at, uh, my girl and I were at, uh, 
last bookstore and there was a hardback book for uh lp covers hard rock lp covers mm -hmm. just the art and bands i'd never even heard of and albums i i didn't or eps you know because how it used to be they would release all kinds of little oh well this is just a single this is that this is yeah. all these different versions of basically what amount to the same shit you know if you put yeah. it together and just some of the artwork on some of these things was just ridiculous the level of detail and the level of effort had been put into <laughs> making these things and, and sometimes it was a matter of not just uh, uh like let's say a big full painting or you know you can tell a lot of work's been put mm -hmm. into to structuring this but uh the, the idea is like where they would come up with these w just weird far out to I, and what really pisses me off is <laughs> if i'd known i'd be talking about this i should have set one in my mind to actually make as an example but <laughs> if you ever come across this book on on uh album art of, uh from the hard rock hard rock album art from the 70s and 80s it's it's worth a look yeah. and i'm not saying you got to buy it cuz i don't know how many times you're going to look through it but it is worth a, at least a look yeah all right yeah so how did you two meet though to to come and put this project <laughs> together um we met at a, a zine event yeah. in L.A. Zine Fest or? Uh, no, it was a much smaller, much, smaller. Uh, much less attended, yeah. much less fun event. Um, so basically it was yeah. you two in <laughs> Tom's was, living room. <laughs> He's like, sort of. It was I got a, zines, man. It's a, it's an it event. Was, it was in a weird it, rec hall yeah, somewhere in El Segundo, and like, I mean, it was, it was a noble effort for a festival, but it didn't really pan out. Yeah. And uh, we, you know, you ever seen like, Break Into Electric Boogaloo? You know, like the, the, the. You know the last scene where they're all fighting, they're all like break dance fighting in front of the like the Rex. <laughs> the Rex trying to see yeah, it. that's where it was. It basically. was kind of like we had a festival in there, and there was like all that shit going on outside, and nobody came in to see comics. Well, it would be hard to break away from break dance fighting. <laughs> but we met, and we, we started talking. We, we found out we lived like half a mile from each other. Yeah, like, literally, like right he lives the like corner. literally up the street from me, and then we just started hanging out. Yeah, and talking comics and. He, he came up and bought some of my comics. I went to his table and was like, what's this Henry? I had never heard of Henry mm -hmm. and Glenn at that point. Took it back to my table and I like almost pissed myself when I was back at his table like 10 minutes later. Like, holy shit, this is the funniest thing I've seen in forever. Well, and, he, and he likewise had this weird, the beginning of this weird series called Galactic Breakdown starring this character named Roids. Oh, basically, wait, I've <laughs> you've seen this, right? This is fucking, you know I remember seeing, yeah, yeah, I saw it at Zine Fest for the first time. I'm like, what the hell <laughs> that's him, yeah. is it's, this? Yeah, that's just this comic. guy just, just flexing and just angry. Does, he just, he just does as much stuff. like space steroids as he can, and then he launches into space yeah, and has space like a coke, fucking galactic breakdown, just all loses out his war. shit. Yeah, yeah it's just, amazing. It's the most, I mean, like. I don't stupid. know. You can say it. You wanted to say it. I mean, he, he's, <laughs> it's intentionally stupid in it a really smart way. It is intentionally stupid. In a really smart way. Well, and, and then like, stuff like that, if you can't tell that it's dumb on purpose. Yeah, this yeah. guy's name is Roids. Yeah. Okay, like, that's, that's your and first clue. And he fights, clue. like, whore bots and like, <laughs> yeah. stuff like that. It's, it's in, I've been into it's fights with whore bots. It's incredibly insane. No, they're always, you, um, you think it's like 15 bucks. Like, oh, here, oh, you want more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that doesn't include tip. What, what do you mean? So the Look, it's all in the envelope. Whore should have a built-in ATM. Right? Sure enough, that's a good idea. You know what? Yeah, you put that in there. Actually, you know, should have just swiped his card in her vagina. A Horbot's high and mighty until <laughs> until you break out that WD forty and you're like, oh, need a hit? Need a who's who's a little squeaky right now? Uh, yep, nectar of the gods right here, bitch. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so yeah, he did that series, and but he also is part of Drippy Bone Books, which publishes a lot of weird like art zines with like a lot of other different artists and stuff. Yeah. So. Uh, we've both been like self-publishing like all kinds of stuff for at least a dozen years. Yeah, you've been doing it for a lot longer than me, but I've been doing it for like about four and a half, five years. Now. Yeah. So, but yeah, we met at the Zine Fest and like met through common interests of self-publishing, and then with this idea, you know, initially we were going to self-publish it. We were our plans were to do a Kickstarter and like launch the series ourselves, but uh, once we got interest from a publisher, we were like. Well, let's give this a shot. Yeah. See if it. Thank God we didn't have happens. to do Kickstarter too. It's and a, it it happened, and yeah, yeah I'm way happier yeah. <laughs> than having to deal with Kickstarter right now. So was, yeah, I can only imagine um, having actual publishing and funding already taken care of, it's so nice. you can get your vision out there. It's something <laughs> you've spent plenty of time with. But uh, you know, I'm sure my listeners are going to be interested in to know a very specific thing about this comic, and that is. How fucking metal is this? <laughs> Just look at it. There's, I mean, there's some I mean, pretty. There are more. There's, there are there's more middle some, fingers in this book than any other book, I think. <laughs> there's there's some pretty fucking metal shit in it yeah. as it goes. 
it it, it ends metal as fuck. I'll tell you that much. So when the, as it starts winding to a close in the last several issues, it's just all out. Now, what what kind of genres of metal do we go through in this book? How, how do you? How do you <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's hard to say because it's set in seventy, so it's not any actual genres of metal because in 1970 you pretty much only had black sabbath yeah and sort the of beginnings of led zeppelin cream, right a little bit of uh new wave of british heavy metal but before it really went yeah uh you might have had harmony i mean harmonized like, guitars but you didn't really have a lot of double bass or anything yeah yeah like i mean like i've been collecting uh biker movie soundtracks lately on on vinyl because i'm a, also a vinyl junkie but i like i've got like six or seven so far and they're like almost all like psychedelic hippie yeah. songs you'd be few, amazed like, how unhappy like hard, s- hard surf songs here and there but like that's <laughs> that's as hard as it gets because there's most of them, those soundtracks are like 67 it's like a guy 69. named walter crackerdale singing like, like a if, folk song on it it's like if, you met, if like the biker genre of movies that happened like like maybe like 77 to 80 yeah. it would have been a totally different soundtrack situation it would have been all like stoner rock and really really awesome like weird underground stoner rock bands and stuff if you, you that you know so, what but even even further into the 80s you could have even got weird techno yeah uh, new wave like the crotch rockets and the whole <laughs> john day. carpenter yeah. kind of like sound state stuff and they, yeah whatever yeah little s- faux cyberpunk and then later in the 80s you know all the all the hair metal bands were in you know with it were into bikes i mean like i, I was saying to jed from the zigzags oh, that's true yeah this they, morning like the, the beginning of kickstart my heart mick mars plays a perfect like guitar i mean motorcycle gear shift on his yeah, guitar it's like brr, brr. he plays that on yes. his guitar i'm like jed you need to learn that before you play the human and girls song girls live. girls them on motorcycles yeah, yeah. all the time and although I mean, of course judas priest not very i wouldn't tough, get that so yeah it really isn't i will say that it's not that tough and he says yeah kickstart my heart when i get high, i get high on I speed know. i'm like motley crew is kind of ridiculous is that a euphemism it's kind of no. maybe <laughs> no <laughs> which one do you mean oh that one but uh uh, I would hope that at some point there's at least one Sirith Ungle level <laughs> moment I would love in that. this thing that's just like laser beam sounding basses and just ridiculous lyrics. I'm I'm down with that. I so, mean, it could totally I mean, work. I mean, that's what I, we've got a few bands lined up so far, but we're hoping to see what what who might be approach us once they've seen the comics, see what comes out of the woodwork. Yeah, we want it to be more diverse than an actual, yeah. you know exploitation 70s biker we, soundtrack would and be we too. both have like totally different music to, we have some crossover but like i'm more like a metal and weirdo and he's like more a weird punk and like i don't know we're, we're, we have like two different factions people would figure you guys would have to meet in the street with butterfly knives every time you saw <laughs> Pretty <each other>. much, <laughs> yeah. nunchucks we like a lot of the same things it's too. a yeah. bit like uh the movie beat it or the, the video for beat it you guys are just <laughs> yeah. that's kind of our writing process yeah <laughs> if i had that white outfit the guy had in that i would I would totally fight you in the alley. All right. There you go. <laughs> Fucking, if anybody happens to bring out, uh, can find that uh, something similar or maybe even a, a direct copy of that white outfit from, from Beat It, you can watch two comic creators battle it out in an alley. Strap I don't know. Her, how, strap her hands together. Get yeah. Yep. Switch blades. I, I don't know how, how entertaining that's going to be. <laughs> Seeing his other all, be lots of this, yeah, yeah probably end up with girl slapping and laughing. <laughs> don't, don't hurt my fingers. <laughs> stop, my, stop hitting me in the face. My money makers, this is a fight. my money makers. I'm just gonna try and <laughs> yeah, just that's true. Funky chicken that's you true. the whole time. Uh, uh, well, and speaking of heavy metal, uh, Tom, are you still doing uh, Heavy Tuesday at Footsies? Oh yeah, yeah. Every Tuesday I'll be there tonight. Um, well, I don't know what when this airs, but yeah, tonight. Uh, It'll be it, it, these air on Tuesdays. Okay. Yeah. Evan has uh, has allocated uh, Tears Day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Tears Day. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, he wants we... to make sure that the god, the one-handed god of war from North mythology, is represented <laughs> well by my podcast. Yeah, we uh, every Tuesday at Footsie's Bar in in Cypress Park, L.A. It's a small neighborhood of L.A. You won't get stabbed. Um, trust me. No. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, me and two of my buddies, Jay Bennett, who's uh, who writes for Decibel Magazine, mm-hmm. and is also in a band called Ides of Gemini, um, and then Scott Carlson, who is the father of Grindcore in some ways, who Repulsion. was in, from the band Repulsion, with the three of us at host a metal night every Tuesday at Footsie's. Every time Scott and gets uh, on the uh, the steel wheels. I just start hearing songs. You've never awesome heard stuff. I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> Who is that? I've never Every, heard of this band. I don't think there's been a week in the last four years that Scott has brought in that hasn't brought in something that I've never heard before and I wanted to own immediately. Like 
and I've been, we've been doing it for four years, and every week he's like, "Here's something you've never heard." Boom, and like, "Holy shit, I have to own this!" Like, where did this come from? And he's like, "Oh, there's only like they only pressed like ten copies in Germany, like in 1972. <laughs> you'll never find it." Yeah, I've got ten copies myself. Like, <laughs> like well, how'd you get them all? Well, we don't really want to get into that, <laughs> but there's a lot of children that are grieving the loss of their fathers right now. But not only that, like he also, I mean, because he, he's still also very connected to the metal world, both he and Jay, more so than I. I mean, I try to keep up, but like I'm also, I, I'm spending all my time drawing comics, so I can't keep up as much as they do. But they're up to date with like all the current stuff. Well, I like, try to to add to your your uh, vinyl collection. Oh yeah, you do too. Yeah. I've added some Midnight you, and yeah, uh, some great stuff. A uh, pressing it. from uh, by Midnight from Death Fest of Dude, last that, year. That Night Satan record Night you, Satan. you bought me just at random. Evan. I mean, it's everybody at Heavy Tuesday's favorite. Every time I throw it on, like <laughs> at least two people come and be like, "What the hell is this?" And Night Satan isn't even a metal band. They're like a weirdo synth prog band from Sweden, but they act like a metal band. Yes. <laughs> And their and, band uh, is called Night Satan. Yeah, they basically that, sound like John helps. Carpenter on crack. And, yeah, and surprisingly. That, what's wrong with that? I bought it complete. Just, I had the no idea. Amazing. I just bought the cover. I looked at it. <laughs> I read the songs. And I'm like, Do you, I, I'm guessing that I think you need this. And he and Tom just goes, yeah, why the fuck not? Yeah. And uh, I was hoping when you said that it's a, it's everyone's favorite that every time you put a Night Satan song on now, everyone just screams, Night Satan, and throws their glasses up in the air. We'll get there. Yeah, we're, I'm we're working so. on it. Yeah. Give it a month. <laughs> Evan, you have to look into Night Satan. And at their new their new album, they actually made a short film to oh, go along with it. Did they? It's also amazing. Really? So it, you can find it on, I think it's, on, it's, it's either on YouTube or on their is there, website. Is there but a yeah. Day Satan, though? No, no, he's he, well. He was the Morning Star, right? So I guess he was, yeah. Uh, but no, I guess no longer. Satan it, after dark. Satan, Satan's all after dark. He's just nothing but blue language, curse words, and boobs. Watching Cinemax. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, Night Satan. Even the, the inside cover is just three dudes out in some wilderness. Tundra. Yeah, tundra. Just head in metal gear with Uzis in their hands by <laughs> themselves, just like in a stark wasteland. Just like we have Uzis and we're standing in the snow. That's it. Why not? The cover art it's is something to behold. It's yeah, it's hand painted and it's like some weird dude with a giant laser gun with it's, like a it's over Satan the top. behind him or it's something, great. some sort yeah. of demon. And it's all the proportions are wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, it was it was an immediate winner. And then Night Satan looks like uh, Bob Seger in the Silver Bullet Pants <laughs> logo, kind of. It's all chrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah it's like very... looks like it's going a million miles an hour off the edge of the fucking record. Yep. So yeah, Bob Seger. You know, only a couple songs can I do. Ugh. I, don't, I can't even do that anymore. Yeah, it doesn't work for me. Gale's the wheel. I just uh, I'm like that's oh, all right. No, I get it. It's cool, but. Uh, but not uh, just like that old time rock and roll. That song just makes me want to throw whatever's playing it right the fuck out the window. <laughs> Pretty Evan, much, yeah. Well, how do you feel about Bob Seger and his Silver Bullet Band? Does he have fart noise over there? Not, not, not really. <laughs> He's really not only my, like one step above Jimmy Buffett in some ways. Definitely not my thing. What is, what is my thing that you were just talking about a minute ago is Midnight. Oh, yeah, yes. fuck yeah. Midnight's I could amazing. not have pulled Satanic Royalty off the shelves faster. They got a new album that, that's also I, I know. I, I, yeah. I haven't heard the whole thing They're yet, one of the but best I heard live one song off. So much fun. Oh, fucking amazing Holy live. shit, yeah. that band is so good. I got turned on to Midnight yeah. by uh, my buddy Nate Ulp, uh, who plays in Demericus, and he's the bass player for Lair of the Minotaur, and he's got a new band out called Cult Hammer. Oh. And, uh, I don't know that one. It, nobody does yet. <laughs> I mean, that, that's how fucking new it is, buddy. You know, but when you know about it, you'll be worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, how many hips does it take to turn into a light bulb? Some obscure number you've never heard of. But, uh, um, uh, so he's, he, he knew who these dudes were and he t told me about them, whatnot. And, and also, uh, Joel Grind from Toxic Holocaust. Mm hmm. This dude played bass for him okay. for like their their early stuff, and through this just the, the typical smallness of the metal community, yeah, how everything is almost intrinsically linked to to I mean it's six degrees hardly most There's of the time. There's different factions, but it's all these small factions where you realize like everybody's yeah. involved with each other. It's, I mean, it's, it, comics are very similar in that way too. This is like, true. You know, it's a very small knit world, but it's it's great once you like penetrate it. You realize like, oh wait, now I, I'm. I know 
all these people. Yes. <laughs> and now so. they're 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 not the wiser or better for it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, so they he turned me on to they turned me on to Midnight. And then Midnight happened to be one of uh, my, this friend of mine's favorite band as well. And fuck, man, the first time they came out here to L.A. to play that show for Scion, mm-hmm. whatever the Roxy. Oh yeah. yeah. The, the curtain goes up. The, the guys keeps the bass player keeps trying to grab the curtain and pull it back down. Can he kicks all his waters off the stage at the crowd. And then they just was like, fuck you. And just starts playing as loud as he can. Someone throws, everyone's just stage diving off this thing left and right. Someone throws a, a fake skull onto the stage and he grabs it and drop kicks it up into the ceiling <laughs> at some point. I'm just going, Oh, this is exactly what I wanted to see tonight. Yeah. I got to see them in new Orleans at, uh, the spellcaster, which is this, uh, club that this, uh, musician Quintron owns and runs. And he's like a one man band, he, but, uh, they threw somebody was having a wedding and flew midnight in and my wife's band static static played with midnight and, uh, wizard sleeve, which is a weird heavy punk wizard band. sleeve. Yeah. And it was fucking amazing. I mean, it was the best wedding I've ever been to. <laughs> it was like the best <laughs> wedding party ever. And they were fucking great. And it's just a very small basement club. And yeah. they were fucking loud and great. They're like the mentors raping Thin Lizzy right in front of you, kind of, is what they sound like to me. A <laughs> bit. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they have some like of that. that description. That should be yeah. the name of the next album. The mentors, the mentors raping. mentors raping Thin Lizzy. Midnight. Make that your next album. <laughs> <laughs> Oh shit! Um, yeah, they have a lot of rock and roll to them. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And that's satanic- why they can play over and play like with punk bands and play with straight metal and play with death. Like they can just play with anybody because mm-hmm. they're they're a rock band. It seems like at their core. So I, I like that new. The, there's like that new streak of kind of like somewhere in between punk and metal that like thrash core kind of. I don't know what to call it, but it's like there's a lot of these bands that are like kind of thrashy, kind of punky, kind of metally. They just kind of like mm-hmm. fit into all of it. And that's that's where I've been. Well, I know they really referred to uh, like uh, Black Breath and bands like Black Breath and Nails, Entombed yep. Core, sort of. Yep. But I, I don't consider them even all that remotely similar. Besides the fact they like the boss heavy metal pedal, they don't really right. play songs that are the same. I watch Black Breath, and I'm a huge Black Breath fan. Super proud of them guys being from Washington, like myself. I'm from Seattle. They're from uh, up north, mm-hmm. um, but and, and Bellingham, I believe. But uh, uh, watching that, I watched them play Slide Bar in Fullerton, maybe hold 200 people, yeah, if that. And uh, they get six songs in, and they played so fucking hard and heavy, they blew out the electrical system, <laughs> and the, the fire department came and shut the whole fucking thing down. That was that was it. You got six songs, and yeah, peace oh, out. Man. Slide Bar is such a weird place. <laughs> it, it, it's odd. It keeps it's changing. Like, it's like going to a metal show in the middle of downtown Disney. It's, it's, oh, it's really weird. It's not quite that. It's not bad. quite that, but it's, no, it's no, kind of no, weird. No, that no. Way. I mean, they, I like it. They get a lot of good shows. I'm not dissing them. They're, I mean, they do a noble effort, but it's, it's kind of there's kind of because it's in the middle of a strip mall. Yes. It's kind of it's a weird. Well, sort place of. Well, it's go got see. this whole little <laughs> lineup of restaurants that turn into bars at night. Yeah. So uh, my buddies run Bourbon Street, which is always on the weekends, all very uh, top forty, whatever, and. Uh, Usually they have DJ, this guy, DJ Roughneck, he, and he's actually really good at putting together uh-huh. the video. He does the whole package, and it makes all the college girls drop their panties like nobody's business. But, That's I mean, he's, he's, good at, he's good at his job. He really is a good DJ for yeah. um, you know, way better than you'd expect. Oh, I'm just going to wander in a bar in downtown Fullerton. Yeah. He's really good at his job. But, uh, we need more panty dropping at Heavy Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, well, that's I've, try, I've brought women. No, I, I've tried. I'm like, no, no. That's, yeah. Metal Knight's always a hard girl. sell. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to find a girl that's really into metal. That was part of the reason why I knew that my girl was a keeper is because I couldn't use my Watain tickets to go <laughs> to the show. I was I had to leave uh, on some sort of business whatever, and, and I'm like, well, I would you would you go instead? And she's like, fuck yeah, you know. I'd already showed her Opus Diaboli, and she's like, I want to see this live. I gotta have this. <laughs> Like, well, I know you're not, you're a vegetarian who, based on, you know, don't want to kill animals, not based on anything else. Like, there's going to be, like, animal corpses and fucking blood everywhere. She's in the first row. Fucking Watain, it's cool. I was was there, too. Yeah, (laughs) fucking great show. Yeah, she might have moshed into you at some point. Actually, actually, you moshed into my girlfriend. You actually accidentally punched her in the back of the head. (laughs) uh, She's, if you saw it, she's, like, about a sixth of the size of you so like you didn't even feel it you but know. that's why <laughs> she recovered fine but She's you know okay. what our movie you know for her and i it's like that movie uh 
uh, God damn it. The, the, oh, I can't remember it. Oh, the visitor. It's like the visitor. Oh. <laughs> so I punched her in the back of the head. Now all of a sudden stars shot out of her and she became, you know, cosmic Jesus. And, you know, it was all, uh, was this at the Marduk show? Yeah. The Marduk was Watain, Yeah. Inquisition last year. Oh, I didn't make it to that one. Oh wait, no. No, this okay. was just Marduk headline. Okay, wait. Inquisition was a different show. Well, Inqu Inquisition opened for Marduk on that one. It was the show where Watain played, though, wasn't it? It wasn't. A no, year no, no, it was Inquisition though. Marduk. You're right. Inquisition yeah, yeah. Marduk. I'm mixing up two shows. Which was a great fucking show. The Vex. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah the Vex know. is a weird place. It's a weird place. It, it looks sounds like terrible, but it's, it's it does actually a weirdly good place to see a show. As I badly. hate going out there. But. It's almost no rules, sort of. Although I tried to get on the stage for Marduk. Yeah. Because I know those guys and the security was like throwing a fit. They thought that. So, uh, and then I had to try and keep the security guard from not falling over and knocking. <laughs> over. I'm like, don't fuck their amps up, you dipshit. <laughs> and then later he's like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, what was I going to do? Punch you out? Come on. <laughs> I mean, you're just doing your job, but you're a little overzealous. But all I wanted to do is get up there and jump off the stage. That was it. Yeah. You know, it's not even a very high stage. Nope. I mean, a, a midget could fall from there, a small child, and they'd probably be okay. Yeah. Yeah, they'd bounce. They yeah, sure. No, they're made out of like uh, <laughs> they're made out of what is the substance in uh, the Nutty Professor? Uh, flubber. Flubber. Yeah, they're made out of flubber basically. <laughs> Midgets are made out of flubber. See, we have facts here <laughs> for you, you people. We just want to make sure that you've learned something <laughs> as well as been entertained on these podcasts. Uh, <laughs> sorry for <laughs> sorry for punching your girl in the back of the head. She's still alive. That's mainly your job, I hey, imagine, in private. She survived getting punched by Josh Barnett in yeah. the head. Uh, uh, my, my Speed Wolf shirt got torn that night. See, it was tragedy <laughs> for everybody. Not many people can claim surviving being punched in the head by you. True. So. Yeah. That, yeah no, there's a, it's a very short list. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I haven't even punched Evan yet. Not yet. No, I'm waiting but, for it. <laughs> no, but we, we're we're only you know so many episodes into this whole ordeal at this point. There's plenty of time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so you guys put this humans together. Now, um, you had your own zine project going. Yeah. Is that on hold? No, I'm I'm right still now? doing my own comics and writing my own comics and publishing, mm -hmm. uh, and doing this. But this is my main focus at Priority. the moment. Priority. Yeah. yeah. But Paying I do bills. have that, yeah. that comes first. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Uh, it, and it's such a big project and we're collaborating that it needs the mo majority of my attention for sure. Mm -hmm. But I just, I'll have a comic coming out for, um, comic con as well called force majeure, mm -hmm. which is like my Chuck Norris versus killer Colts comic killer Colts. Yeah. Like killer Colt, you know, like a, like a, you know, I thought you were talking about, uh, like, like some sort of angry, you know, uh, martial horses. arts horses. Oh. <laughs> Colts. Yeah, that Colts, would work no. too. Cult. Yeah. Well, killer, killer cult. Killer cult. cult. Yeah. Oh, yeah. cult. Cult. Killer a madman with dozens of followers. Yeah. Like lots of uh, uh, jumpsuits with laser beams. <laughs> not, not so much, but uh, <laughs> lots of beards and sunglasses. You know. Does anybody do any space steroids in this one? Or no, how about normal steroids? No, but there might be a crossover. Well. A few of these guys could be on steroids, but there's nothing uh, happening directly in the story, no. And Tom, you obviously, I I know that you've had. Oh, of course, you've got Henry and Glenn. Yeah. And I'm. Is this is this a an end of the to the chapter of Henry and Glenn stuff or? Uh, for now, it's a, it's a bookend for now. I, I'm not killing it. I mean, if there's a demand and and I feel the uh, inspiration for a new story down the line, I'm definitely going to come back to it because. One of the nice, I mean, like when I did the original book with my friends, the Igloo Tornado, which is my old art fraternity, um, it was really just like, we literally like, it was just stuff we scribbled on bar napkins to amuse each other <laughs> and it turned into a book and then it became such a big hit. I was like, this is stupid. Like, why does anybody like this? It's like the dumbest thing I've ever done <laughs> because I was also like concentrating on my, my serious graphic novels. Um, but then like, it was so successful that I decided to like approach a sequel in a different way and make it more comic booky. And I was like, how can I make this more entertaining for myself? And like, as an end result, after spending a year working on the mini series and then putting out the final book, I learned that, uh, I really like making entertaining comics as opposed to it's just not that introspective. Dumb, it really isn't that dumb. No, no. It's, it, it's not that dumb, but it's, um, but it's but also it's like, fun. The, but it's the dumbest, funnest. Fun. I mean, like, compared to my other comics that I was like being trying to be like a really serious artist, I mean, this is like 
it's kind of dumb and fun and like it but i learned you that i liked Darryl, making dumb Darryl, and fun and Daryl it's, hall it's, and john oates as satanist neighbors <laughs> yeah so it, it, it became very entertaining to me and i was like i like doing this so that and that actually i think helped me want to open up to the idea of working with him on the humans too is like yeah so i'm not killing it but it's gonna be there's gonna be a pause for a while, a while while i work on the humans what about the the fine art side of things like your previous projects like the wolf and your prints that you've done and i mean i've, I've still got ideas i've got a, a i mean i've got a third graphic novel uh that's sort of the you know the blot and then the wolf and then i've got a third one that i've written a long time ago that's still kind of evolving in my brain called the devil but eventually i want to write um but for right now i'm focusing on the humans and uh you know various freelance projects that'll help pay the bills <laughs> like album covers and stuff but uh but yeah for right now and and, and like i said i've got like four other like bootleg popeye stories i want to draw they're like really crazy and like, that's right we're on that bootleg insane. popeye tip here right <laughs> you know we and uh so i want to do that i don't know I've, I've, I've always got i've got more ideas than i think i have time on earth for so i'm never gonna stop having stuff to draw mm-hmm. yeah it's just how much time do i have to devote to it so and of course the question has to be asked um henry and glenn yes they've read this right no uh well it's hard to say we tried to give a copy of the original book to glenn through my friend jay bennett who writes for decibel magazine i gave him a signed copy gift wrapped for glenn and he refused to look at it didn't want to have anything to do with it he's afraid it might and actually affect pr- and him and proceeded to go on a rant about uh <laughs> internet hipsters uh and jay generously sent me a transcript <laughs> of that moment of the interview which i then turned into a comic strip that's the now it, the last page of the book <laughs> so the very last page of the book is a uh quoted oh there he is There's it Jay. is a word for word <laughs> version of glenn's actual response to the book um we also have <laughs> If you look up on, uh, there's a Henry Rollins interview by Nardwar from a couple of years ago uh-huh. online where Nardwar asks Henry about it. And he kind of goes off on a side about like, yeah, I believe in the First Amendment, but I don't know what's inside the book. I've never you looked at it. say anything about, you know, letting ru- the rule of iron. And he didn't say that. <laughs> but there was another one. We, we actually put a quote on the back from Henry that uh, because we saw it in an interview, somebody asked him about the book and he just said, you know why I'm a de- depicted in a comic? Because I'm fucking famous. <laughs> <laughs> so we put pretty that great. on the back. Oh, that's great. And it's pretty perfect. But um, yeah, so they, they don't, I don't know what their actual reactions are How could are you not it. read this? You know, even if they say that they haven't, you, they, by now, Look, if someone wrote a comic about me, I would basically believe. fist fucking polar bears all across the universe. <laughs> well, You'd be proud. I'd I believe would, that. I'd probably be pretty read proud because I mean, he's did got I tell the you ego. About, did I tell you about meeting London May on the airplane? Oh yeah, shit. I think I've heard. La- last summer, I was on my way back. I don't know, was this two summers ago? I don't know. Anyway, last I was year. on my way back. F- I was flying from Baltimore to L.A., which is like a six-hour flight. And for our listeners, who's London May? London May is the original before Chuck Biscuits and then replacement after Chuck Biscuits drummer for Sam Hain, Danzig's second band between Misfits and Danzig. And if you get the albums, they're worth they're worth the pull. They're great. They're like some of the dirtiest shit he ever did. Yeah. Um, and so I was Southwest Airlines where you get to pick your own seats, right? So I go in. I got an early, I got in early and I chose an aisle seat with an empty seat and then the the window seat was a very attractive woman so of course i picked that but i left an aisle <laughs> hoping that it would be left empty but then a little later i see this like lanky gothic dude dressed in black with long hair i didn't recognize him at first like heading my way and like i'm dressed i'm wearing like metal shirts or something so he sees me he's like oh i'll sit next to that dude so he asks if he can sit next to me he sits next to me and turns out like halfway through the plane ride six hour plane ride he starts talking to me and he tells me, he's like, oh, I'm in a band. And I was like, oh, what a band are you in? I was like, uh, I play in this band called Sam Hain. Have you heard of him? I was like, fuck, what? <laughs> are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> and he's like, oh, yeah, you're a fan? I'm London May. I was like, holy shit, you're London May. That's awesome. It's, and, and so then he starts asking me, he's like, oh, are you, a, are you a, in a band or something? Because I look like sometimes people think I'm in a band. Band-esque. Um, and I was like, no, I'm a cartoonist, but I do a lot of artwork for bands and stuff. So I was like, telling him about that. I told him about everything yeah. everything else I've done before I did Henry and Glenn. And then I was like, and maybe there's this book you might have heard of that 
I don't want to bum you out right now, but I did this book called Henry and Glenn Forever. And he went from this, like, to... <laughs> and he, he you put bummed his, him out. He put his head in his hands for literally, like, 30 seconds. And then, he, and then he sat up really fast with a deep inhale and goes, all right, we're on a plane next to each other for a reason. Let's talk about this. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Let's and fucking hash this out right now. Yeah. About a comic like, that has nothing to do with me. I'm yeah, like, but. cool, let's talk about it. So then he like gave me a very kind of like harsh but but nice like reaction to the book. Like he was – he, had, you know, my first question was like, have you actually read it or are you just reacting to the concept? And he's like, no, I've actually read it a couple of times. And like, A couple of times. We had this back and forth about it and – you know, I couldn't convince him, but I was like doing my best to be like, you know, he he accused it of being a homophobic book, and I was like, well, you should consider talking to some of the uh, LGBT <laughs> contributors. Oh, that, that cracks you know, me up. What is it with you gay and people to the book. who want to always say your content is something when it's entirely obviously not that? I think that's just our current environment. People like to judge the things wolf is on misogynistic. Face value. It's the least misogynistic thing in the whole world. Well, yeah, it's- I mean, yeah, my my book, The Wolf, was accused of being a misogynistic, sexist book, and then eighty percent of the people that have bought it from me are women who seem to love it and consider it a very romantic story. I'm a manly, manly man. And same right thing now. with Henry and Glenn. There's, <laughs> and it is there are factions this of is, people that yeah, think this that is Henry not Glenn homophobic. Is homophobic. No. and then there's also legions of I have legions of gay and and uh, uh, LGBT followers that love it and and embrace it and yeah. because they have a sense of humor. So it, I there's don't know. There's nothing mean spirited. But I think that's any time really. nothing you, anti any any. It's not just like the wolf. There's nothing misogynist about all the it in jokes any way. are making fun of who they but are always, as yeah. people. Not but I always as try to. Gay. Yeah. <laughs> I often straddle that line, you know, between like I want to push people's buttons. Well, I want to like if you did. And I want to make people question what they're looking at, right? And f- what they're thinking about, and you know, push those buttons and like say like hey have you thought of it this way that's what i try to do with a lot of my art so i'm always going to be straddling that line where people are going to be offended or not and so it's a necessity though and human evolution because if you only that's the only way you push you people only, to learn right and if you only prescribe to to the to to notions that that are safely enveloped in an idea where you can't you can't ever push it into this area or you can't ever talk about it yeah. in this way or you can't ever make mention of it, then then you won't ever in, even still, if you wanted to know how much you dislike something, one of the best way you need to understand it first. Yeah, true. And, and, just and unfortunately, we live in a time where like everybody's like surrounded by their own echo chamber via the internet. Right. So they like they don't really, unless you force them to, they don't get exposed to something outside of their normal purview. And then when you do, they're either like violently react against it, or you know maybe it opens some new doors for them but it's it's a weird world nothing sacred you can make fun of and say whatever you want yeah. people that feel like shit is sacred and there's certain things you can't touch i feel I, like and even i mean still, some I people have degree, said that just you, the fact that i touch I'm, it true yeah are you inappropriately are you touching it like <laughs> like uh <laughs> sometimes you know you trap it in a, in a corner in a when it can't escape and then you uh i lure it you with candy it close. into the yeah. back but i mean it's it's about intent and it's about it's it's more than just i mean if you, you want to make ju- fun of- I mean, it goes back to you can't judge a book by its cover. It goes, that's one of the Already oldest have. fucking things. And <laughs> people do that. You know, some people see this. People are doing they- stupid things yeah. consistently throughout. And, you know, as you, as you say, the microcosm of the Internet, which is essentially basically the look at how great everything, how I think of things is world, uh, especially with the way Facebook will will we'll put posts to you to try and reinforce or how you you try to pick friends and to only reinforce your already yeah that e- echo and, chamber that's yeah. what right. i mean yeah it's just and, uh, for everybody and i was like i uh, so there was the the whole thing about the the gal the texas cheerleader right who's a, an avid hunter yeah right? oh yeah and then there were some pictures so everybody Flips the fuck out yeah. about the pictures right off the bat. Saying I look to remove at remove her from Facebook. And I'm look. Oh, and I, the shit I was reading is murder her and kill and she should. And I'm going. Oh, you know, I, I'm I am a hunter and I I grew up hunting in in Washington. You know, my dad was an incredible hunter. His his grandparents, his his uncles, they you know they all lived back in the woods. You know, they'd hunt, eat, grow gardens, and yeah, you know, and and worked in the logging industry. I mean, yeah. So they. I knew a lot about what it was the wilderness and the and and nature would provide to humanity as 
just existing within it and being able to respect it at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And so I see this and I, I, you know, I just see pictures and I go, well, you know, I'm, I'm not really into big game hunting. Like I don't see any reason to do that. It doesn't really do anything for me. At least yeah. if I go and I hunt a deer, I'm going to clean it myself, butcher it myself, uh, eat all of this. I'm yeah. going to have someone turn a burger. Uh, you know, I'm going to, because I, I love deer, not just as a food. I, I think they're amazing animals. I've yeah. seen them in, in every kind of environment. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I'm, me as a hunter, me not as a hunter, me and all, I, I think they're, they're I, re, I have a lot of respect for them. But I also understand the way hunting works. And, you know, there's giant fishing game commissions that are created to know how many there are, who's getting sick, how many their offspring mm-hmm. they're having, yeah. how many that there needs to be via how much land uh, area is available to them. You know, it's not just a, a fucking, hey, go out there and just go kill everything. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. go murder every animal and destroy. I mean, yeah. hell, if, if it's that, then, I mean, corporations no, are doing most, that Most anyways. hunters have to be conservative. They have to, they have to be aware and understanding that if there's no population of this animal anymore, you can't hunt it. So what's the purpose of hunting something to extinction, you know? So th- you would, and people that don't hunt or don't, I wonder how many of those people go to the grocery store and still buy a steak and shit. Oh, of course, and yeah. that's well, the other thing. I mean, you know? I, I'm a vegan pacifist, but I have no problem with that girl. Whatever, I have no problem with Ted Nugent. Yeah, it's you one know, thing. Whatever. Like, have a I, problem I, with you know, it, it's it's a personal thing, and I don't. I do. I where I draw the line is I don't like anybody telling anybody else to do what what sure. they should yeah, do. That's what I thought. And was then the, most the big thing, so thing. Fuck come, that. Like, it comes it, out about whether this you're girl. liberal or right wing, right. whatever. Like, if you're trying to force somebody to your worldview, I will not talk. And it always not agree with it. Always breaks down to that, especially when it's like hunting. Then it becomes a right wing versus left wing thing. You know, they love that. You know, fucking. It's it's Zeus versus uh, Rip from <laughs> from No Holds Barred, but uh, um, and figuring out who's right and who's left in that one that's the yeah, tricky wait, part. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. So, um, uh, but so I'm looking at it, but with anything on the internet, I don't I, and, and any information you give me, I'm not going to knee jerk jump on it and start vomiting out a bunch of uneducated bile at a subject when I don't really understand what's going on. Yeah. So then more stuff starts coming out. I start reading. It's like oh. So basically, she's uh, you know she's a rich girl because otherwise who could afford to yeah, go out there go and do big a, game hunting? Yeah. But but what essentially it is all the any of the big game actual any of the kills are are made in so let's say oh I want I would like to be able to take a lion one day so what they do is she'll she'll say that to whoever owns like this giant thing of savanna or land whatever and they'll go okay hey um, it came about that this one lion is is whatever the case may be he we need one lion culled and that's it for the for our what acreage we have and whatever is available so we need one lion to be taken and that's it and since you already put in for it then you can pay all the fees and and they're going to kill the lion anyway yeah so then she gets to go out and go hunt the lion you know it's not like she's run murder off. the bitch yeah ah. and then the other and then another picture was like of her and a rhino and her description is yeah i tranked it so that they could he, they could go and uh, bandage and attend to some wounds that this rhino had had been inflicted uh, in a fight with a lion or some other yeah, big cause cat. Yeah, because there's one where she's like holding a cheetah and it's obviously tranked because it's like she's holding it like this and there's no blood, there's no gunshot. Well, then anything. there was like a leopard and she's like, you know, they pay, they 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 figure out well. We've got this many leopards and they're, you know, and actually I already knew this from watching Natural Agreement Graphic was that leopards will actually take people. Yeah. So in urban areas, you have to be aware that a leopard could they'll leave. take you to the tree. Right? Yeah, they'll like, just take you right the fuck out. You, are, <laughs> you don't mean shit to a leopard. And I don't care how much you love animals. Animals don't necessarily <laughs> feel the same way about you. I, not to say you shouldn't respect them because I really do. I love I love critters. I'm a big fan. But uh and I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to do as much as we can to not only help animals have the best playing field they can to let nature do its thing, but also for the environment itself to be the strongest, mm-hmm. best aspect that it can be so that we can continue to have the, the most amazing earth that we have. And yeah. part of the funds that she pays into helps to keep some of these areas where they're trying to make sure that there's habitat still for a lion to exist, for a zebra to exist, for anything, these things that even if some may need to be culled and she gets to pay that some exorbitant fee or her dad does so she can have the permit to go kill it, that that land exists so that we can actually have these things. Yeah. You know, probably because of some asshole corporation or some fucking guerrilla leader going out there and just mashing yep. up everything and trying to just rape the land like we as humans do. Well, it's like, like Ted Nugent's arguably a big asshole, but 
at the same time, he raises all of his own game that he hunts. So, like, whenever vegans are, like, an- anti Ted I'm like, he's, he's, he's got his own preserve. He's raising these animals so he can hunt them. Like, that's not, I mean, if honestly, like, the big problem is, like, big meat industry. Like, sure. Farm factories. Like, don't go after the hunters. Go after the fucking yeah, farming yeah, industry. Sure. All the guys the that want factory farms that are, like, you know, creating sp- these. Spread mal- cow- awful, mad cow like, disease by actually yeah. chopping up the cows. And then trying to feed that like, cows <laughs> yeah. don't eat fucking cow meat. I any idiot could tell you that. A six year old <laughs> will tell you that it goes moo and then it eats grass. So chickens will eat chickens, but cows they don't want to eat cows. Yeah. Chickens, but they shouldn't be eating chickens. No, no. At, at the chickens same time, are, you know. I'm chickens, gonna have, we're gonna have some vegan rage in the comments section. <laughs> vegan rage. <laughs> and uh, you know what? Veganism's cool too. I mean, because it, when you make your own personal choice to do whatever is that it is like you want to do, like Montezuma's revenge. Exactly. <laughs> vegan rage. Vegan like, oh, rage. Oh man. Oh, oh, too much. That kale. Too much cheese. Quote up. unquote. <laughs> oh, this tofurkey doesn't sit well with me. But uh, I mean, and here's the thing, you know. She's a part of uh, in something I, I'm not really interested in going out and hunting big game, like I said, but she's not trying to murder all the big game in the world. Yeah. She wants to be a hunter, but she also wants to work. She And clearly by tranking a, a, you know, an animal and trying to make sure that it gets attended, care and attended. And, and so I put up even a little thing on Facebook saying, oh, you know, that was dumb. by the way, <laughs> she's probably dumb. better, knows more about animal conservation, behavioral patterns, science, all than, you, than most of you that are. Yeah demanding for her to be killed based on an uneducated opinion of something yeah. so you know there's never a shortage of and stupid people calling in this for world. anybody to be killed is just fucking yeah. retarded if you don't agree with <laughs> something don't well, agree with it stupid. yeah you and know, if you're gonna really at the extent it needs sure. to go you if you want to ask for somebody to be killed really you're gonna you if you had your one chance you know you got, you got hitler over here and mussolini kill. or whatever and then you're like oh but you know what this girl fucking killed a lion i think i yeah. seen pictures I'm not on quite the internet. sure of the entire story, but yeah, it looks really bad. And yeah, I that. saw somebody else say what a horrible person she was. So I'm going to have her killed. <laughs> uh, this is ridiculous. And he, I did get. A, I remember I got one that uh, made a bunch of fucking comments and that had clearly not read even the article I put up. And I'm like, it's like wow, it's just like that, huh? Proving you think, the point for yeah. you again, right there. Idiocy. But uh, hopefully idiocy will not strike when it comes to Henry and Glenn Forever and Ever, the collected edition, because you have a Ford by Rob Halford. Yeah. Yeah. That's Speak. fucking awesome. I'm <laughs> yeah, a head, I'm a, I'm a straight man, happens. but if Rob Halford made a play at me, I don't know where I'd go with that. We've talked about that. Yeah, before. we've talked about that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, fucking long live least, Rob Halford. At least yeah, give no, him I mean, a hand job. At I'm, least. Yeah. I'm amazed that, yeah, he was open to it and uh, that he wrote such a great I mean, it's one of the. It's so funny. He like he really he gets honestly it. gets into the spirit of the book, and really the way it reads, it's like he's <laughs> he's turning the he's turning the gun back on me. Yeah. Like what I'm aiming at, Henry and Glenn. Rob turns on me, and he's like he's like I'm gonna drag you out of the closet, Tom Neely, and it's 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 great. It's antagonistic and funny and. So it just proves perfect. everything you ever thought about Rob Halford. Yeah, like, like he's got to be cool just, as shit. He's, he's just got to awesome. be funny as hell, and he is. Like, yeah, and that it, he was he was relatively easy to get through to. That was amazing to me too. Because that's I, like, impressive. I tried contacting like five different other people that I thought would be good, and my friend Jay, again my DJ pal Jay Bennett, he was like, "You got to at least try Rob Halford." It's like he'll never respond to me. He's like, "Just try it." And so I did, and I wrote to his publicity agent. He wrote back like two days later. He's like, "I'd love to." I was like. What? And then it was like two days after that he sent and it. And two to days you. later he sent me the whole thing and he was like uh, I was like, Yeah, that's just too perfect. And so yeah. I I I feel like I've been blessed by the metal god. And uh, You've definitely owe him some favors, <laughs> the metal god. I don't I don't know where that's gonna go, but Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. But uh and I'm I'm hoping the Rob's uh, got an idea. The uh the humans becomes not only just your your intended ten issue that you're gonna put out here, but that this is going to grow into something. I hope so. Something yeah. greater really than that. I really would hope so. It'd be yeah. a lot of fun. It'd It'd be really fun. So I can see the glint the in your eyes. Ride. You guys thinking, oh, film. Oh, we got big <laughs> ideas. We got big ideas. Uh, if we could do our entire arc as a comic, that would be huge. I and just want anything action out of that. figures. He really, he really <laughs> wants, I want. I want action figures. He wants Todd McFarlane like <laughs> action think, figures with bikes. I think Image can make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> we might we'll see it's a possibility yeah but uh we're really really glad to have you come on the show here today Thank and you. chat with us and uh and and 
let the world know about the humans and Henry and Glenn forever and ever, and also your zine. Oh, uh, uh, Galactic Breakdown. Galactic Breakdown. It's uh, and Force Majeure. Force Majeure. And Force Majeure. Especially, I've read Galactic Breakdown before. <laughs> um, don't don't look at the cover and I mean do, but don't look at anything with and ha, just don't start create any it. expectation. Just open your mind. Yeah, just start just reading. Open just your mind read it, to it. Then read it again and then be like, okay. I, I mean, honestly, I think like anybody that likes what's on Adult Swim these days should love Galactic Brain Out. Like, I mean, it should be a cartoon on Adult Swim. It's so fucking over the top and ridiculous. It and is crazy. Insane. So like, if you're a fan of like that weird sense of like dumb humor, it's a perfect comic for you. So Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Fucking, if you like stupid shit. Hey, I'm a guy. Fucking, right you like, here. If you like cool. trauma, if you <laughs> yeah. like anything like that, you yeah. Know. Uh, um, but uh, that that being said, uh, we really appreciate you coming on here. Where can we find you guys, uh, Tom? I know you're at, at Tom Neely, right? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, well I will destroy you. dot com. Right. Um, and my Twitter and Instagram and that stuff is I will destroy Tom. Ah. Humansforlife.com. Humansforlife.com is the humans website. And then drippybonebooks.com. Drippybonebooks.com. Do you have an Instagram or Twitter? Uh, I have an Instagram, but I just started, so I, have no, I think it's Keenan at Keenan Marshall Keller. <laughs> I have like four all things. of it. I just started it. I Is just it always Keenan Marshall Keenan Keenan Yeah, it's key, it's the whole fucking thing. Yeah. And then uh, good luck typing uh, that. If you're in. at San Diego Comic Con, we're going to be at the Image Booth on Wednesday, and then we'll be at Last Gasp Thursday and Friday. Fantastic. With a bunch of Henry and Glenn artists all signing. Yeah, awesome. Henry Glenn and human I, stuff. I'm trying to plan to be there either Friday or Saturday to work uh, the booth with um, uh, Buana. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, the Grass Hut Yoshi, booth. the Grass Hut guys, and, uh, and Gargamel. Awesome. Shit. Yeah. Get out there Friday. We'll all go out. Yeah. <laughs> trying to do my best. Uh, you can find me at, uh, at Josh L. Barnett on Twitter and Instagram. Also look for the podcast on at JB Conquers. That is our official podcast uh, Twitter handle to keep you guys all informed. You can download us at uh, SoundCloud, iTunes, and FoxSports.com. Uh, the FoxSports.com is a little bit of a navigation thing, but trust us, we are there. <laughs> and uh, today's guests, uh, Tom Neely and Keenan Marshall Keller, <laughs> Von Furstenberg the <III>. third. <laughs> And uh, I am Josh Barnett, the War Master, your host. And as always, uh, death the false metal, people. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>